When I talk to people naturally, the question comes up, what do you do? And I'll keep it vague for a reason. I say, I teach tennis. And some people will ask more detailed questions and I will say, I teach tennis online. And people are so perplexed at this idea that I teach tennis online uh, through videos or remotely, they can't grasp that this type of coaching can work. And I'm gonna be really honest with you guys. Before I started my YouTube channel many, many years ago, I was skeptical of online coaching if you will of teaching somebody remotely I always had this belief that you had to be on the court with the student to improve the student's game but I'm here to tell you that since I started my YouTube channel I have had hundreds of players that have improved tremendously by simply watching my videos and how do I know that these students have improved by watching my videos because they send me footage and they will reach out to me privately and show me videos of themselves playing tennis and I see the transformation from when they were beginners to what they play like now and I can tell you the improvement is absolutely spectacular and in today's video I'm going to show you one of those students and why am I doing this in video format because this particular student happens to have a YouTube channel of his own as well so this is a good opportunity to show some of his improvements publicly and also promote his channel. All right, so as you can see, here, I got ace there as well, but we're in the middle of 2019. And this guy, he had a very good serve. It was a complete stranger, but I wanted to challenge him, see if I could bring his serve back. And uh, yeah, it was right up after the Wimbledon final of 2019, uh, Federer and Djokovic, uh, which was really inspiring. So I wanted to play for myself. Yeah, as you can see here, that shot, that last forehand there, I was really proud of that, even though it's just a simple put away. But uh, I hit him with the drop shot. This was the very last match, very last official match of this year. And uh, yeah, with the forehand put away again, ace through the middle. Yeah, I played some great tennis here. And these last couple of shots, I think you can see like what type of player I am. Uh, I became, I should say, just an all court type of player. I like to to attack, move my opponents around the court, hit the drop shot, and then just came come forward. Here he thinks I hit a drop shot, but I go back, and then I push through with the forehand. So Nathan reached out to me through Instagram and he wrote, Hey, Nicola, I just wanted to let you know that mostly because of your YouTube vids, I made a big transformation in my eyes since I started playing tennis three years ago. I'm self-taught, so understanding what I needed to work on was key and your knowledge was the best of any online coach. And as you say, very intuitive. I've filmed a lot since the beginning. So I decided for the start of the new year, I would make a three year progression video. If you don't have time to watch it, that's okay. I just wanted to thank you for the lessons, even though we never met, but maybe you'll like it. And I'm going to be honest with you guys. The type of transformation that he was able to achieve in only three years is outstanding. I've been doing tennis coaching my whole life and I see players of this type of level at the club system. And a lot of them improve much slower than Nathan did, but some of them don't improve at all. And you're probably thinking Nathan did this by playing five hours a day. No, he only played three to four times per week, but he was very specific and determined in how he was going to develop his game. He didn't just go out there and hit. He wanted to learn how to play the right way. So again, I highly recommend that you subscribe to Nathan's channel, watch his video. He even made a response video uh, thanking Intuitive Tennis for all the progress that he has made. Uh, which videos did I watch to, well, get my serve, but I think in general too, which videos did I watch? And uh, in the beginning for the serve, I had one video in particular that really helped. It's this one. But after that, I discovered one channel in particular, which for me at least stood above all the rest of the tennis instruction videos. And that channel is Intuitive Tennis. Nicola, I think he's called, well, yeah, as the name says, it's, it was a really intuitive way of uh, knowing what to do, really, and 
I think one of the things that makes him really good is that he differentiates between what are fundamentals in the stroke and what is style. And for someone like me who wants to understand everything so I can apply it to my own game, it was by far the best channel. So shout out to Nicola from Intuitive Tennis. If it wasn't for him, I wouldn't have been in the same place that I'm now. So Nathan, here's what I'm going to do for you. I took a look at your strokes and while you've improved tremendously, there's always room for improvement. This is even true for elite level players. This is the beautiful thing about the game of tennis. You can always get better. And while your strokes have gotten a lot better, there are still a few things that I would like you uh, to correct. So I'm going to do a quick video analysis for your serve, your forehand and your backhand. So Nathan, your best shot by far is your one-handed backhand. It is an absolutely beautiful shot to look at. The technique is sound. One thing that I do notice on some of your backhands is that you come out of the finish a little bit quick here. You can see how the arm bends in this particular moment. And it's a little bit early, not a huge problem. You even see some elite level players do this from time to time, especially if they're going cross court or a short angle backhand. But I want to advise you to hold the finish just for a split second because what's going to happen when you finish with the entire body is that you're going to utilize power sources in a much better way and sometimes by bending too early here by coming out of the shot too early you're not utilizing the body to the extent that you can so just have the intention prior to your stroke starting to finish fully all the way as far as you can possibly go with a fully extended arm a la Roger Federer. And my favorite shot that you hit in this whole series is this one right here. It's an absolutely spectacular backhand down the line winner. Look at that thing. This is absolutely perfect technique. Look at your huge shoulder turn. Look at that racket going towards the back fence. Look at you rotating into the contact with a full extension. Look at this beautiful finish going backwards where the butt cap is pointing forward, the tip of the racket is pointing backwards, you're squeezing the shoulder blades, the arm is fully extended, and you hit the screaming winner down the line. You definitely need more on those. But back to my original point, you see even here you come out of the finish kind of fast. So just hold that finish just a little bit longer, just so we know that you're finishing good every single time. Because again, you're showing highlights, I'm sure there's back end mistakes that you're committing. And in order to minimize those mistakes, make sure that your finish is nice and clean. Make sure that your hand is going above the level of the shoulder. We can see here that while the hand is above the level of the shoulder, you can go a little bit higher. Now, of course, it's going to have to do with your range of motion, your flexibility, but you are a super fit guy, a young guy, a great athlete, a former basketball player, and I'm sure you can go a little bit higher with your hand. The one advantage that you're going to get when you go a little bit higher on your finish is that you're going to get more topspin. So while there's nothing wrong in the way you hit this backhand, it is a little bit horizontal. You can see the swing path here. It's more of a horizontal swing path, and of course, it's more of a flat ball winner. Nothing wrong with it, but topspin will allow you to hit the ball hard and consistent and it's gonna cut down on some of the errors. So in addition to you focusing on holding the finish a little bit longer, also focus on having the hand consistently go above the level of your shoulder on your backhand finish. Now let's take a look at your forehand. I will say that the forehand is not as strong as a backhand, but having said that, you do have a fundamentally sound forehand. There's a lot of things that you do that a lot of players at your level don't do and I'm going to point those out so you have a loop which is great and what I look for for all players even at the high level is where contact is established and I'm not concerned about the structure of the arm in other words the fact that you're bent here it doesn't concern me all I look for is that you make contact with the dominant shoulder in front and I'm going to show a clip where you're on the near side of the court where you can see it a little bit better but this is absolutely a correct contact because your dominant shoulder is in front of the non-dominant shoulder. Now, one concern I have is the position of your left arm right here. What happens on a lot of your forehands is that the left arm is kind of tucked in, and I do think that can inhibit some of the torso rotation. So what you got to do at this moment of the forehand is what I call the hand shake tuck. You got to imagine shaking somebody's hand in front of you with the left hand and point the fingers forward. This will clear the left side of the body and it's going to allow not only a contact that might be even further in front but also a clear area in front of your body where you can freely swing in a circular swing path by you having the arm right here 
this might inhibit some of that. So this is the number one concern in your forehand is getting more of a hand shake tuck position. You can see even on the finish that the left arm is still across the body here. So this is not the end of the world. It's not a catastrophic error, but it is limiting you a little bit on your forehand. And take a look in this clip here. This is from a few months before, but this is a better view because you're on this side of the court. You can see that the contact is good. The swing path is also good. You got a top spin swing path. You're going over the ball, which is great. But take a look at your left side of the body. You see how that left arm is tucked in? And so in this particular phase of the forehand, you need to do a handshake tuck with the fingers of the left hand pointing forward. This will allow the left side of the body to clear much better. Now let's take a look at this forehand. This is probably the best one that you hit because you made contact more in front than on the other ones. Again, on this part of the forehand, there's absolutely nothing wrong. This is all style right here. Uh, you can do this if this feels comfortable for you. There's no problem with it. You have a loop. The sequencing of the torso rotation is correct and you are making contact in front of the body. So in other words, that right shoulder, the dominant shoulder is in front of the left shoulder. And you did a little bit better job with your left arm position here. You can see that the left arm is positioned a little bit more forward and now there's more space in front of your body. And it's quite possible that you made contact in front because you cleared the left side much better on this forehand compared to some of the other ones. And on the finish, we can see that the left arm is still somewhat uncomfortably stuck here in this part of the body. So don't be afraid to have a little bit of distance on that left arm. Apart from that, the forehand is looking really good. I like your finish. This is very clean right here. And it's perfectly okay to catch the racket. In other words, to have the racket go into your hand in this particular phase of the forehand. This is something that Federer does. You're not really catching the racket in front, but at the end of the stroke, when the racket is finished, swinging out, you just lay the racket into your hand. And this is something that can happen quite naturally if you finish all the way. So the forehand is good. You got a nice looking stroke. These are good fundamentals. Just work on the left side of the body and it's gonna keep getting better and better. And now onto the serve. You have a Nick Kyrgios inspired serve. And I'm gonna do a full video on the Nick Kyrgios serve coming very soon on the Intuitive Tennis YouTube channel. But I think you might be able to pull off the serve. I don't really have a problem with you copying Nick Kyrgios. There's a lot of good fundamentals on your serve. But the one thing that jumps out at me is your toss. So if we take a look here, we see that this toss is at 11 o'clock. Now, here's the confusing thing. If I take away this line right here, it looks like you made contact at 1230, okay? It looks like this is a 1230 contact because it's occurring on the right side of your body. But this is an optical illusion because what we have to do, and when we're talking about the clock, in other words, where to toss the ball, we have to draw a line right in the middle of your body. So we have to go by the left shoulder in the beginning phase of your serve. So prior to you starting the serve, you have to envision 12 o'clock prior to starting your serve, which is going to be right here. This is going to be 12 o'clock. Okay. Now, if we go on into your service motion, you will see that your toss has an arc. In other words, it's not going to be at 12 o'clock. It's going to go over towards 1130. That's where you make contact right here, 1130. And unfortunately, because of this toss that arced too far over to the left, your body is bent in an extremely uncomfortable Wait, this is not a good position of the body to be in. You're not going to be able to maximize your power on the serve. And this is simply due to a toss that's too far towards the left. Remember, on your flat serve and your slice serve, you want to toss the ball between 12 o'clock and 1 o'clock. When you do that, your body position is going to be more upright in here and you'll be able to apply more power to your serve. Now, this is quite a complex problem and I made an entire YouTube video on this issue and the problem is that you have a serve style where your back foot comes on the outside right here so it's moving from here to here now here's the issue when regarding the toss because of your body position starting in this area right here it's not going to remain in this area so take a look because you move your right foot towards the outside your body position is slightly going to change and now we're slightly even more towards the right so let's take a look again let's clear these lines so this is going to make more sense to you so you started right here you're going to draw a line right through the middle again lined up with your left shoulder and because you have a serving style where the back foot comes on the outside right here your body position is going to change it's going to shift over slightly towards the right 
This is not a big difference, but it is a difference. And this has to be taken into account when you toss the ball. So what you have to envision, in addition to generally tossing the ball a little bit more to the right, you have to plan for your body to be in a different location. In other words, you have to direct your toss to this area right here and the beginning portion of your serve. So let's go back to the beginning phase of your serve. So when you start, you're actually going to envision tossing the ball right here at one o'clock. And what's going to happen because your back foot is going to move to the outside, this is going to end up being 12 o'clock. So let me repeat that again. Because your body position will shift from left to right because of the serve style that you have, you actually have to intend to toss the ball at one o'clock and not 12 o'clock. Okay? because your one o'clock is gonna turn into 12 o'clock. And repeat it again. You have to envision to toss the ball a little bit over towards the right because your body is gonna slightly shift and this position right here is gonna end up being 12 o'clock, a perfect contact point for your serve. And then now, because you have adjusted your toss successfully, your body is not gonna be bent like this. It's gonna be slightly bent this way and you're gonna be making contact at a much higher place and are going to be able to apply much more power to your serve as a result of it. And here I want to show you an example of a better toss. This one you directed at one o'clock and you ended up having a more natural body position at the moment of contact. So take a look at this toss. It was directed with less of an arc, which I'll tell you about in a second. So it went straight up and naturally when you make contact, you can see that your body was not as severely bent as it was on the other surface. This is a more natural position. And you can see here that you have a full extension of the hitting arm and you're hitting the ball at a much higher place. So I'll repeat it again because of your surf style where your body position goes from here to here because you bring the back foot towards the outside. You have to plan ahead for that and leave the ball more at one o'clock prior to your surf starting because when you actually make contact, this is more of a 12 o'clock contact, maybe 12.30 right here. So I hope you understand. This is a complex thing that I just explained to you. But the simple solution is when you start your serve, you simply plan to throw the ball more towards the right. So don't plan to throw it at 12 o'clock. Plan to throw it at 1 o'clock and you're going to be just fine. Another thing that I would like you to change on your serve is the position of your hand and the racket and the trophy phase of your serve. So I would like to have your racket closer to your head. Your arm is too straight here. There's not enough bend in your arm and this is a simple fix. All you gotta do is get the tip of your racket closer to your head. And this is naturally gonna put more bend in your arm and it's gonna make the racket drop more efficient. It might also drop the elbow slightly. If that happens, don't be alarmed. It's perfectly fine to have the elbow slightly below the level of the shoulder. Now let's take a look at your racket drop. We're gonna see something that is quite frankly phenomenal for somebody of your level to have a racket drop that goes right where your lower back is. This is something that is spectacular. Many players that have started playing tennis three years ago will not achieve a racket drop that's this deep. A lot of them will have a shallow racket drop or not a racket drop at all, i.e. a waiter serve. So the fact that you are dropping the racket at this level, it is spectacular. But I'm telling you that if you adjust the position of your hand and the racket in the trophy phase of your serve, the racket might be dropping even lower. And now let's take a look at the approach towards the ball. We're going to see something else that is spectacular and that is the on edge position of the racket shortly before you make contact so this is something that most players of your level have trouble with they will indeed be completely open here in other words the strings will be pointing towards the sky and they are lacking pronation into the contact that is the important pronation that is the pronation that matters that is the pronation that creates more racket hit speed going into the ball and you have this and this is something that is phenomenal now you also have continuing pronation which is the pronation that happens after contact so you have the best of both worlds and since you already have this you shouldn't spend one minute thinking about this as you continue to get better at tennis some players that have the back foot on the outside on the pinpoint stance especially on the wta tour don't have an elbow position that goes very far back it will usually have an elbow position that goes 
right aligned with the dominant shoulder. But in your case, your elbow is going on the left side of the shoulder. So in other words, you have a sufficient coil. I can see your chest right here, and that is good. And that is one advantage of the corkscrew serve a la Goran Ivanishevich. If you are able to coil like you're doing here and have your back foot on the outside, it kind of twists your body like a corkscrew, and this will result in a lot of power if you can get away with the service motion, which it looks like that you can do. So I highly encourage you to continue doing this pinpoint stance. This is something that can suit your serve well. One thing that I wanna advise you to is that I did see different positions of the foot. So sometimes your foot was a little bit more on the outside. Sometimes your foot was a little bit closer towards your left foot. So I do advise you that you have the same distance between your feet on every serve and you don't have a variance in how far the feet are from each other because that will influence your toss and many other factors. So do work on having the feet in the exact position on every serve. How far away should the right foot be from the left foot? That really depends on your comfort level if you are comfortable with this position right here then by all means continue doing so just make sure that you're doing it with this distance from the right foot to the left foot on every serve and nathan another thing on your serve that you should pay attention to is applying forward momentum your forward momentum on your serve is not maximized because on the vast majority of your serves you land behind the baseline now why is that now i don't have side footage of your serve i can't tell for sure but i'm assuming that you are tossing the ball too far back so simply toss the ball a little bit more inside the court and if you lean on your serve naturally you're gonna land inside the court more frequently this is one of the most important power sources that you can apply to your serve because you take your entire body weight and bring it into the contact and that's easily done if you slide that toss consistently inside the baseline even on your kick serve and naturally if you do that you're going to land inside of the baseline on most of your serves so we talked about your left foot being too far back on the vast majority of your serves and how you're going to fix that but how about some of the other elements on your finish such as your dominant foot such as your non-dominant arm and the racket position so these are going to be stylistic elements to some extent naturally as you execute the fundamentals on the serve that dominant leg is going to kick up that is a natural consequence of the serving motion however the non-dominant arm is a stylistic element so some players will not do what you're doing here and some players at the high level at the elite level will do this in other words the non-dominant arm is going to swing out you can continue to do this this is perfectly okay as far as the racket is concerned this is also somewhat of a stylistic element that also depends on what type of serve you're attempting you're going to see a different finish of the racket depending on whether you're hitting a flat serve a slice serve or a kick serve but generally if you attempt to finish towards your left pocket you're going to be in a good position so nathan i have to say you have an extremely good serve for having played tennis in three years the fact that you're ripping aces and hitting service winners is something that quite frankly is uncommon a lot of players struggle with the serve the most out of all the strokes and the fact that you are serving fast you're serving aces i have not seen your second serve so i can't really comment on that but there's a lot of good things happening and if you fix some of the things that i mentioned your serve is going to continue to get better so guys i hope that this video motivated you to go out there and improve your technique but you can see the type of transformation that you can achieve and it doesn't take five hours a day of training you can do this by playing a few times per week so don't just go out there and hit senselessly or play matches you might stagnate because one important thing that i noticed in the videos that nathan posted on his channels that even though he lost some matches against uh, players that he was competing against you can see that those type of players don't really have the fundamentals of the strokes while nathan has much better fundamentals so in other words these players were able to beat nathan because maybe they play tennis longer because you got to understand that tennis especially at the lower recreational levels is not all about technique or how your strokes look it's about keeping the ball in play and the players that can do that at the most efficient way usually win the most matches so my point is that these players while they do well at that certain level, they are likely to stagnate at a certain level. So if you don't improve your technique, if you don't get rid of some of the technical flaws that you have, you are unlikely to advance past a certain 
recreational level. Nathan, on the other hand, is building the correct fundamentals and he is allowing himself to progress much further than those players that he was losing to. So in other words, there's really no limit to how high Nathan can go at the recreational level. So I think it's quite possible for him to reach the 5.0 level, which is the highest recreational level. Of course, in the Netherlands, they have a different rating system, but I do think that it's possible for Nathan to get to the highest recreational level. And it's something that the vast majority of recreational players never achieve. Why can Nathan achieve this? Because he is putting all the hard work in building the correct fundamentals on his strokes.